All right. Well, welcome back, everybody, as um, we get started in a new week and uh, we continue our study in the book of Acts. We are going to be picking up today in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, and uh, continuing to see what happens as Peter starts to address the crowd of people that has just witnessed this miraculous event around the day of Pentecost. Before we get into that, as always, we want to go to the Lord in a word of prayer. So let's go ahead and bow our heads now. Father, we thank you for this day and thank you for this time that you've blessed us with. And Father, I ask in the name of Jesus right now, Father, that your Holy Spirit will reveal truth to us, that you'll show us uh, what it is that you have for us today. Lord, we just ask for you to teach us open our eyes and our ears, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. So, as I had mentioned, uh, the disciples and, and the, uh, the believers were gathered together in this upper room. The, the day of Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit entered them, and they began to speak in tongues, and people saw this happening. And, and last week, we, we were talking about Peter's response to the people, and he uh, gets to verse 38 and he tells them that it's time for them to repent and be baptized uh, in the name of Jesus Christ so that their sins could be forgiven and that they can also receive this Holy Spirit. So he makes this awesome, awesome promise to them that, hey, what you're witnessing, the things that you're seeing happen in these people's lives, this can happen in your life too when you believe on the name of Jesus. <clears throat> but here, picking up in verse 39, he actually sort of even sweetens the deal a little bit more. And he, he goes on to say this, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So here in this passage, as I said, he, he really, um, he makes this offer even more amazing. The word promise here, he's, he's, notice he says, this promise is for you, but also your children and those far off. This word promise uh, is a Greek word, epigelia, the Greek word epigelia, and it means to make a pledge or provide a divine assurance of good. A pledge or a divine assurance of goodness that this is going to be a part of your life. And it's not only for, notice that the thing that I think is really impactful here is, is Peter doesn't just make it about the, the people that are standing right there in this moment. He actually talks about future generations and talks about the, their, their children, that this promise is for them as well, but he uses this term, all of those who are far off. This Greek word that, that translates to far off is makron, and it really refers to something that is at an extremely great distance away. This, is, uh, this would not just have been across town or across the room. You're talking about something so far like the opposite end of the earth. Um, that kind of distance, totally outside of what is possible that you could, uh, you could reach by yourself. And in this context, he's not talking about the people uh, who were living right there in that moment and the distance away. This context is really talking about far off in terms of time, far off in terms of time. So he's saying that for you right now, this promise is for you. For your children who are coming later, this promise is good for them as well. But not only there, it doesn't stop there, it continues to those far off. And, and in fact, one way to look at that is, is Peter's actually direct re, directly referencing people like you and me. 
today, 2,000 years later, this same promise is just as real, just as good for us as it was for the disciples right here in this moment. We are those people who are far off, and that salvation is for us today as well. So it's an amazing offer that Peter is giving these people. And it, it's, it's one that has an impact on us even today. So Peter definitely has the people's attention at this point. They've seen this a, a miraculous event. Peter shared with them how it's possible for them to experience it in their own life. And in verse 40 and 41, he goes on. And he sort of closes out his, his presentation to the people with these two verses. We're going to read these together. With many other words, he warned them. That's interesting, right? With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their numbers that day. So this was a massive impact that took place here, a massive impact for the kingdom. Peter tells the people that uh, to save themselves from this corrupt generation. What is that really talking about here? The word corrupt comes from the Greek word skolios, skolios. That might sound a little bit familiar, scolios. Uh, we have a English word that gets its origins from this Greek word, and it actually refers to a, a medical condition that people can have called scoliosis. Scoliosis literally it, uh, is a disease when, when somebody's uh, spine, their back is, is not straight, and it, it, it's crooked and it, it does, it's bent improperly. So this word, uh, scolios, literally means to be crooked and curved. He's saying to the people that they must not follow that crooked and curved path that the people around them are on because it's not a straight path. That path is not going to take them to the joy and the peace and the hope and ultimately the eternal salvation that we all desire. The only way is through Jesus Christ, not to follow the generation around them. And then in 41, we start to see the result of what happened uh, from these actions that have taken place. The work of Peter and the disciples, uh, as Peter closes out his speech, uh, Luke then comes in with some commentary. Peter has, has concluded, and then the people begin to react to what has taken place, and, and Luke gives us some commentary here. He says around 3,000 people accepted the words of Peter and were added to the number of believers that day. This can also shed sort of a significant truth uh, that we should be aware of. There were many who did not accept the message either. Do you remember back at the beginning of this chapter several weeks ago, we talked about how the crowd, if you remember it said, the whole host of people recognize what was going on. Remember, we talked about that being a miraculous work in and of itself, that here this is happening. And there, there were as many as potentially uh, 30,000 people gathered around seeing and witnessing these things. But here, that was back in uh, verses 5 and 6 in chapter 2, by the way. But here it says that about 3,000 people were added if we look at that and we do the math, 3,000 is an impressive number, but it's actually only about 10%. One out of every 10 people actually heard what Peter was saying and then made that decision, accepted it, 
and began to move forward in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So as impressive as that sounds that on this one day, 3,000 people came to know Christ as a result of what they had seen and experienced and heard from Peter and the disciples, the reality is there were many, many more that did not believe. If we, if we look at the estimates of historians that there could have been 30,000 people hearing this, then there were 27,000 of them who heard and yet turned and walked away. They were not impacted and, and they might have thought it was really interesting and cool. Man, they were talking in tongues and, and all this stuff happened, but uh, I'm okay, it's, it's not for me. And they walked away. And that concludes this whole dramatic uh, event of the day of Pentecost. What happened to lead up to it, during it, and then the result of what the Holy Spirit did during that time. And at this point, Luke sort of makes a shift in what he is talking about. He picks this up in verse 42. So we, we have this growing group of believers that are coming together. We have this, uh, this fellowship that, uh, that is together of believers. And from 42 to 47, uh, Luke here begins to give us a description of what that life was like and what was taking place in the group of believers during this time. And uh, in verse 42, verse 42 has a lot of content, and we're going to be here in verse 42 for quite a while. Verse 42 says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This is a one sentence description of the attitudes and the activities and, the, uh, and, and all the things that were happening in this group of believers at this time. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. <clears throat> This is a really broad overview of what was happening here during the day-to-day -day life of the early church. And we're gonna take, Luke really gives us specific descriptions of these activities. There's really four primary activities. If, if we listen to this verse and try to break it down, there are four activities that Luke uses to describe the life of the normal believer. <clears throat> The first one that is described, this is the first thing that these believers would have engaged in. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, this, this comment, they devoted themselves, uh, comes from the Greek word proskaterio, proskaterio. This is the same word that is used uh, back in chapter one, verse 14 of Acts. And it's, it's the same word that described the way that the 120 believers behaved in the upper room. It, it literally is translated like this, to be con in continual devotion to something. It's defined as being adherent and consistent in one effort to be steadfast and unremitting in your care of that one thing and to continue in it at all times. So <clears throat> this word really implies a level of commitment and dedication that in many ways exceeds uh, the human logic or, the, or even human comprehension to understand this. It actually goes beyond natural means. And uh, it, it's really, uh, think of it like this. <clears throat> this. This is, I think, a really good way to maybe drive home how important the commitment level is of the believers here and, and the, the real strength of this word that was used, proskaterio. 
Think about a mother, a, a mother who has a four-year-old son. And uh, that, that four-year-old, her little boy, has been uh, seriously injured. And uh, there's a chance that, that this, young, this young boy could die. And uh, he's in a lot of pain because of this injury. He's suffering. He's scared and, and he's laying there. Now, I want to tell you in, in, uh, in a normal uh, biblical design um, of a mother and a son like this, that if that mother saw her son suffering, scared and, and afraid of death and, and, and she was there, there would be nothing Nothing that could stop her from coming to be beside her son. No matter it would, what it would cost her, no matter what she would have to do, you would be able to break her legs and she would literally crawl with her fingertips to get beside her son. She would lose her life before she would stop seeking to be near her son, just to even whisper one comforting word into his ear or to, to touch his head. One opportunity she would give her life up to be close to him in that moment. You see, when these believers devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, there was nothing that they would not do to pursue it further. There were no excuses given. There was nothing that was gonna stand in their way. It wasn't gonna matter if it was raining outside or cold, if they, were, if they weren't feeling well, whatever it was, nothing was gonna stop them from pursuing a deeper understanding of who God was through the teaching of the, of the apostles at this time. Seeking the Lord and a deeper relationship with Jesus and obeying the things that he had taught them uh, took precedence over every other thing in their life. That was the fundamental core of what this means when it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This, this, this isn't talking about um, okay, we're, we're part of this church. We're going we're gonna to go ahead and we're going to show up on Sunday morning for a couple hours. And uh, that's, our, that's our commitment level. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a five-minute devotional at the end of the day. And that's our commitment level. This was a constant deep devotion to pursuing God. <clears throat> the second word that's a part of this here is, is the word teaching. It says, you know, they devoted themselves to what? The teaching of the apostles. Now, this, this word, this Greek word, is actually um, uh, a root of an English word, the English word dictate. Dictate. Um, now, if you think about this, uh, think about it like this. When a doctor, when you go see a doctor, uh, after your appointment, as some of you may or may not be aware, the doctor will dictate his notes from the uh, encounter that he had with you. Uh, that'll include the diagnosis, the, the treatment, um, you know, the findings from his examination. All of those things are gonna be written down and then used to help others as they treat that patient. In the same way, God spoke through the apostles. He, he dictated to the apostles what was going to be taught. And those things were written down, those things were heard. And even today, as we read these words, we're reading the, the dictation of God, written down through the hand, or spoken through the mouth, and written down through the hand of, of apostles. And they're helping us in our daily walk, helping us to learn more about who God is. The question is, are we going to be devoted to them in the same way that the apostles and the believers were devoted to them? 
The second activity that's described in this verse is that they engaged in fellowship. They engaged in fellowship. What does that mean here? When we think about fellowship, what do we, what do we think of? Gathering, talking, being in relationship. Hey, I'm gonna go have some fellowship with my brothers and sisters tonight. We're just gonna to gather together, we're gonna to share some stories, we're gonna laugh, and, and that's what that means. The Greek word behind fellowship, however, has a bit of a deeper meaning. It's the, it's the word koinonia, koinonia. And it's not just talking about interactions with other people or just having fun with them or just, yeah, I, I know them and I'm in a relationship with them. The true definition of this word has a, a very real significance because it's not just talking about relationship, it's talking about an intentional intimacy with one another. Individuals who engage in, in a koinonia relationship desire to have a relationship. And as, they, as a result, they actually pattern their lives in such a way as to support that relationship. And I, I, I hope that this is uh, I hope that this is making sense, that, that the commitment level is similar to almost what we talked about earlier with that proscatario. You're saying that, hey, this relationship, it's not just a friendship, it, it's, it's something deeper, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna intentionally structure my life to support growing deeper with this person. And it's not something that's taken for granted. It's not something that's taken lightly or insincerely. It's a real serious commitment. And, and this, this word has another interesting context in that it implies that this is a gift. There are two things that this can tell us about this type of relationship. Here they are. The relationship that we have together is a gift from the Lord. That koinonia, that cannot happen through natural means. This is not like any relationship that can be experienced in the world between human beings. There is a, a love that exists between believers in Christ that cannot be found anywhere else in the world. You're not gonna be able to go to a social club, a sports team, um, uh, a gathering of people with like kinds of hobbies, uh, anything else. Your workmates, your classmates, we can have relationships with all these people, but nothing, no other relationship between human beings, between friends, is going to be the same as the gift of fellowship of koinonia fellowship that we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It, it's, a different, it's a different level of transparency, a different level of love, a different level of care that exists between believers in Christ because we have the same spirit, we have the same father, we're in fact family. And it also implies this, that it, it is between these relationships that we have the opportunity to exercise the gifts that we've been given for the care of our brothers and sisters. So we have somebody that's gifted in, uh, in singing. And so that person can, can share that gift with their brothers and sisters and that koinonia relationship to encourage and, and to, to love on and to inspire their brothers and sisters. You have somebody that, that's, that's a good carpenter and, and there's work that needs done in somebody's house and that person can take that gift that God's given them and serve and love on their brothers and sisters. So in this Koinonia Fellowship, we have the opportunity to share the giftings that God has given us, to use those gifts to bless our brothers and sisters. The third area that this verse describes is that they broke bread together. They broke bread together. This literally means 
quite literally, that they ate together. The act of eating a meal, especially during this time in, in the Roman uh, society, was a significant act. The process of preparing a meal and serving it was not as easy as it is today. And because of this, if you were going to eat with somebody, it was a pretty significant engagement. It would have re represented a lot of time and effort, and it was not something that people would have taken lightly or for granted. Inviting somebody over or, or coming together in a meal would have been a big deal. And this act would have really signified and been a symbol of that koinonia fellowship and relationship. People would have watched this and they would have wondered in being perplexed what was going on with these people. How is it that they are coming together to eat Notice it says they, they ate bread daily. This was something that was happening constantly. And it would have definitely um, uh, been, been something that would have aroused the interest of the people around them. <clears throat> now, this word, the breaking of bread, broke bread together. For the believers, this would have had a second meaning as well. Not only were they coming together for a general meal where they were, they were literally just eating to, to nourish their bodies. For the believers, the, the breaking of bread also signified eating at the Lord's table. Now, this would have been what we today call a communion. Um, uh, where, where you actually remembered what Jesus did on the cross. The, the, the bread, the unleavened bread, would represent his body, which was broken. The, the, the wine or the juice would represent his blood that was poured out. And so this was a, uh, this was a sacrament that they would have partaken of when they gathered to break bread in order to remember who Jesus was, what he did on the cross for them. And uh, we, we don't know how that was practiced. There's not detail here to, to show that did they start the meal off by having that? Did they eat first and then partake in, in, the, in the breaking of bread to remember Christ? But we do know that, that this word indicates that these were, these were consistent practices when they came together, that they shared their food together and they remembered the, the Lord's Supper and what he did for them on the cross. The fourth thing and the, the last thing that this particular verse mentions is this, that they prayed. Now, <clears throat> you might say, oh, we, you know, we often, we prayed at the beginning of this message. We, we will pray at the end of this message. And then probably at some point, if, if you're listening to this and you're a believer, you're, you're probably gonna pray later today or tomorrow. Um, this word, when it says they prayed together, it doesn't simply mean that they, they were praying in the, way, in the way that we often think of prayer today. This Greek word, prosechi, Prosechi has a very specific implication. It means to come together collectively in prayer to the Lord. To come together collectively in prayer to the Lord. So the believers didn't only have their private prayer room or engage in personal prayers. They also came intentionally together for the purposes of praying as one body. Here, here's, here's sort of the, the definition uh, as, we, as we read what this means. Uh, to come together in prayer in one place that had been set apart and suited for the offering of prayer. This would have been a place where they would have gathered corporately uh, that, that was be specifically meant for this activity. And today we might refer to this or think of this as sort of our church building. It could equally also uh, be a place in the open air where 
uh, believers would have gathered. Um, in the context of what was taking place here, it could have been on the bank of a stream or a river, a place in the wilderness, or even a street corner. But it was, a, it was a place that had been determined by the believers that, hey, this is where we believe God is sending us. We are intentionally going to gather there, and we're going to pray as one to God our Father. In one accord, if we remember what, uh, you know, that, that verse that talked about, they, they were coming together in one accord and almost that, that symphony-like uh, style prayer where the Holy Spirit is leading each individual person. While our, uh, this should tell us one thing, that while our individual prayer time is absolutely vital to our own spiritual growth, we also must never forsake coming together with our brothers and sisters in corporate spirit-led prayer, because that's, that's the pattern that we see established by the church. So it's important to remember these things. It's important to remember that we, we, uh, we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. We engage in that koinonia fellowship with each other. We desire uh, that breaking of bread, that, that intimate relationship where we build and, and eat together. The remembering of the Lord's Supper and, and that communion act of, of what Jesus did on the cross. And then that we come together in prayer focused prayer time as a body where we're coming together. This, is, this, is, this would have been an awesome environment to live in, to see the people of God working and living and praying together. And I think it should make us question, where are we at today in our fellowship? Where are we at today as a body of Christ? So with that, we are gonna go ahead and come to a close for today. We're gonna to pick up in verse 43 next week as we continue to learn about what's going on in this early church. So let's go ahead and close out in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for all of these awesome things that we can read about. But Father, we also ask, Father, that, uh, that, that you come into the relationships that we have. You come into the body of Christ that is here today. Father, so that we can experience these things just as they are described right here, Father. Father, may you lead and guide your people to be one in unity, to be one body, one people, one heart, one mind, one soul. And that through that, through the love that we have for each other, others will see your love as well. Father, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. God bless, and we will see you guys again next week.